Council first calls um, Mariam Fumani, who will be discussing the methodology and protocol of obtaining witness statements and evidence to the tribunal. Um, before you begin, uh, can you take uh, the oath and repeat after me? Yeah. I solemnly declare that I will speak the truth. I solemnly to speak the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Over, over to you, Council. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Bumani, you're going to be speaking in Persian, correct? In Persian, okay. yeah. We're just going to turn this on. And if you would just give us one minute and then go ahead and proceed with your statement. Okay. Just for tribunal's guidance, Ms. Fumani's statement appears in the supplement at page 414. Uh, my name is Mariam Fumani. I'm a journalist and researcher with more than 15 years of experience working in the field of human rights, and I am a graduate of Middle East Studies from Trinity Dublin University. As a member of the prosecuting team of Peep, the People's Abon Tribunal and as assistant to Mr. Hamid Sabi, who is one of the prosecutors of this tribunal, I am going to testify. I was responsible uh, to, uh, for collecting the necessary documentary evidence and its documentation for the People's Abon Tribunal uh, with the um, assistance of Shima Mehrani. Uh, Eban the Tribunal from summer of 2020 started collecting documentary evidence and registering the testimonies of those killed and wounded in the protests of Eban 1398, November 9, 2019, as well as the eyewitnesses who saw the events of those protests. At the initial stage, um, we uh, contacted 40 members of the families of those uh, killed in the protests of November and also the eyewitnesses who directly witnessed the suppression of those demonstrations uh, by uh, the police and the security officers. Uh, they were invited to testify uh, before this tribunal if possible. 20 of them, including 11 persons from the families whose members were killed and nine eyewitnesses gave a positive response to this invitation and had their testimony recorded by the prosecuting team of the tribunal. At the second stage uh, in November 2020, through a general invitation by the People's Aban Tribunal, all the informed persons, eyewitnesses, and families of those killed, arrested, and injured uh, were asked uh, uh, to testify before this tribunal if they so wished uh, through designated telephone numbers uh, uh, and uh, we asked them uh, to contact these numbers through WhatsApp or Signal following this invitation. Also, um, the, the social networks that we offered to the tribunal. Uh, following this invitation, 255 eyewitnesses, families of, the, uh, of these people and of, the, uh, and, and of those wounded in the protests of November, reported their willingness to testify before the tribunal. Thus, a total of 275 persons volunteered to testify before the Avon tribunal as eyewitnesses, as well as family members of those killed and wounded in the November protests. The methodology adopted by the prosecuting team was that after receipt of every message, the persons contacting the tribunal were asked to send a summary of what they wish to testify together with the documentary evidence in support of their testimony. This method was observed with respect to all messages received, uh, and the, all of them were almost responded to. Likewise, all witnesses were asked to record, if they so wished, their full testimony in the form of a detailed telephone conversation conducted by the prosecution team. 
165 persons positively responded to this invitation to a detailed interview, and their testimonies were recorded in meetings lasting between 30 minutes and three hours. All those testimonies, after uh, being verified and uh, writing it in the format of an integral, integrated narrative, were translated into English language and were made available to the tribunal's judges. 110 of those who had volunteered at the initial stage to testify stated subsequently uh, that uh, they wish to participate in the tribunal's uh, process only to the extent of the summary of their testimony or the dispatch of the documentary evidence in their possession. Some of them also, because of uh, the security pressures that they had, stated later on that they were not possible for them to continue with the process. And some of them, they had personal problems, illnesses, etc. Uh, and, and that could not participate anymore, and because of the suffering that they had uh, endured during the protests. Therefore, out of 165 of the witnesses of this tribunal, uh, we uh, were able to uh, record uh, detailed interviews of 135, uh, uh, and the 135 were men and 30 were women. 22 of these uh, witnesses were the, the relatives and families of those killed in November, and five of them are from the families of the wounded persons. Uh, and 138 of them uh, are eyewitnesses who directly witnessed the, the events of November 2019. Uh, of the th 138 eyewitnesses, 31 of them were those arrested in November protests. And some of them were um, arrested and were released afterwards from prison on bail and are waiting uh, uh, court judgment. Some of them could go back again uh, uh, to uh, prison. Some of them were furloughed uh, from prison. Uh, and uh, those uh, who were brain enough uh, to uh, give us our, their testimony even during the short furlough. 41 of these people were directly eyewitnesses to the killing of one or more persons in the demonstrations. Uh, the, the, uh, the scenes which are extremely painful and some of it we will uh, see in the days to come. 59 of these eyewitnesses um, had have suffered uh, uh, during uh, um, the uh, protests. Uh, they were wounded, they were injured, some of which were really uh, serious, which uh, um, resulted uh, in their sensory disability or blindness or physical disabilities, which makes uh, normal life for them impossible. Eight of the witnesses who testified to this tribunal uh, are those who, because of their jobs, um, had knowledge of some of the decisions made to encounter the protesters. Uh, and some of these knowledgeable uh, witnesses were uh, also um, uh, privy to uh, the decisions which were taken to encounter the protesters. Uh, 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 for example, uh, uh, an airport employee, an official, Khatam uh, uh, al of uh, the Revolutionary uh, Corps, etc. These are witnesses of this tribunal, and also two p uh, physicians who were either in the private uh, home or the hospital and who were treating the, the wounded people who could not go uh, to the hospitals. And also one a newspaper reporter and one person who had knowledge of the decision made by the Security Council of one of the provinces. And these are all among the informed persons who have testified before the Iban Tribunal. Uh, uh, the, uh, the verification of these testimonies was one of the important responsibilities of the prosecuting team. And in order to uh, verify the testimonies, we had different um, methods. Uh, for example, what was said in the testimony was matched with the videos, with the pictures, and with the, the news uh, um, which had been received from the same uh, protests in the same uh, cities. And we matched them to see if they reconciled. And also, we had another um, method. We had uh, um, uh, witnesses, uh, uh, a few witnesses who would testify about the si a single 
uh, event, and it was another method uh, to verify them, and we tried uh, to reconcile them with the news, which was also um, uh, uh, published by reputable um, human rights organizations. Uh, with regard uh, um, the, to the testimony about the type of the weapons which were used by the, um, the, f uh, um, f the security forces, uh, we also consulted weapons experts in order to verify the testimony. And also, the other method that we had was to identify the locations where the uh, shootings had happened, and also we used the same experts to verify that. On the, uh, other hand, uh, uh, there were other um, uh, witnesses who sent us documents that would um, confirm what they had said. For example, uh, images from the protests in different uh, cities, and uh, we also verified the videos and photographs uh, to see if uh, they uh, really uh, pertain to the same testimony. Those who had been uh, injured or uh, wounded. Uh, they also sent us uh, pictures of the wounded or injured uh, bodies. Uh, they would um, they send us radiology images which shows the bullets are still are in their bodies or were in their bodies at that uh, time. They sent us reports uh, from the forensic medicine or the hospitals. Um, and all of these ensured and ascertained it for us uh, that what they were saying was true. Uh, the, uh, for example, other uh, families who were were testifying uh, about uh, those who were killed during protests of Aban. They sent us uh, pictures of their tombstones, uh, um, the permit for the burial, um, the certificates from the forensic uh, um, medicine, etc. And all of this helped us to verify what we were looking for. And also, uh, we uh, also tried to check the position of these people, the identity of these people, in order that they would uh, guarantee for us uh, that the person had actually that position and what he was testifying about was true. All of this was ascertained. And despite all our efforts, uh, there were some uh, with, uh, testimonies, um, a very minor part of them that we could not verify. and uh, uh, there Therefore, we discarded, unfortunately, such testimony because we were not in a position to verify them. One of the important concerns that we had was to keep the security of the, the uh, witnesses uh, from the 275 uh, people who said they were willing to testify before the tribunal. Or only 22 of them are outside of Iran. The remaining, they live in Iran. And some of the witnesses who are outside of Iran are uh, those who recently emigrated to neighboring um, countries, or in fact, they fled to those countries. And in these countries, they are not in uh, full security either. And some of the witnesses uh, who also live in safe countries, such as European countries, American uh, countries, uh, they still are not sec uh, fully secure because they have families and uh, close people to them in Iran bec and because they are threatened in Iran and therefore they are not fully secure in order to testify in their own name. In such circumstances, and in order to protect the safety of the tribunal's witnesses, we use different methods. Uh, ab initio, uh, and uh, when we were consulting digital security experts, uh, we established a um, security protocol for all the witnesses of the tribunal. And we asked uh, them all to use the uh, protocol all throughout the process. And those who had access to the full text of the testimonies were very few and the remaining colleagues at the tribunal gained access. Sorry, well, it's untranslated in time. Okay. And the, those who had access to the full text of the testimonies were very few. And the remaining colleagues uh, at the tribunal uh, after uh, uh, we uh, protected the private information of the witnesses, 
uh, um, and they were extracted from the witnesses, those people could also gain access to the remainder of the testimony. And uh, also, we um, provided the pamphlets in op uh, for the observance of digital security uh, uh, for the tribunal's witnesses, and we sent them uh, for them. The contacts were made uh, through uh, the, uh, the applications in which messages were exchanged in codified form. And at the end of each uh, contact, some of the points that were required to observe to ensure their security were reminded to the witnesses. Uh, despite uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, the stages, uh, uh, we did something in addition to that. The tribunal's witnesses were identified by a number instead of their name. A specific number was allocated to each witness, and that number was used instead of their name in all the documents and correspondence. Uh, name and the individual particulars of the witnesses were asked only once uh, uh, in order to record it. And when we were asking that, uh, we did not uh, record their name uh, either digitally or in their own voice, etc. Uh, we kept it in a particular file, protected with a password, and well protected, and only one person has access to them. Now, with regard uh, to the documents and evidence which was sent to us by the witnesses, all these uh, security arrangements were uh, respected. In spite of all of these uh, security precautions, the tribunal's witnesses have shown a great deal of valuable courage to contact the tribunal and to offer the testimony. Uh, I, for my uh, part, uh, I would like to thank all the witnesses who have trusted us and have repeated the suffering and the atrocity that they have gone through once again for our purposes. Uh, and I hope that through recording uh, their, their suffering and to present it to the Aban Tribunal, we have been able to administer justice on behalf of the witnesses. Thank you. Before I hand uh, your presentation over to the panel for questions, I have two follow-up questions. The first question is, can you tell us a little bit about the training you have in order to take testimonies that you've received with regards to the process for the Aban Tribunal? As an individual who has over 15 years of journalistic experience and also research in human rights, during these years I have gone through various training programs how to deal with the individuals who have been exposed to severe violence, especially uh, violation of uh, human rights. Uh, especially by the state officials. I know how to talk to them, interview them, and to register the witness statements in a secure manner. Uh, furthermore, for this particular tribunal, before I started my work, I received some training from the experts in uh, cyber uh, security, and I also went through a one-week workshop along with a number of other members of the uh, of, of, of the prosecutor team of this court so that we would be able to verify the, bet, the witness statements that we received and the documents that we received. We learned during that, just, that, during that training program how to uh, record these uh, um, statements and how to store them. And my final question to you is, uh, in the end of your statement, you talk about the fact that you discarded some testimonies. And I was wondering, during that process, was there ever a time when you stopped an interview because you did not believe that they were telling you the truth? Or did you have a process in which you allowed everyone to speak fully and then make the determination after? Uh we never stopped anyone. We never interrupted any witness. Um, and we allowed the witnesses to testify in whatever respect they wanted, as long as it was relevant to the November 2019 uh, events. We asked them to send their documents, testimonies, and we even had a long interview with them. We recorded all of these things. But in the cases that we were not sure that how far their testimonies were true and uh, reliable and how far they correctly remembered the events, sometimes we did not have the problem that they were lying. The problem was that despite 
a short time had passed, two years is not a long time, but many of them had been exposed to traumas, and that could have affected their judgment. As a result, they would have not uh, correctly recorded what had happened before their eyes. As a result, we decided that we should not record their witness statements because that would have not been reliable to be presented to the tribunal. But anyway, we recorded all these statements. We talked to the witnesses time and time and again, and we asked them to uh, to present various aspects of the uh, incident so that we would be sure and certain whether such incidents had happened or not. But if we were not, uh, if we did not come to the conclusion that they had happened, we just uh, discarded them. Of course, there were a very limited number of them, but we listened to all the interviews up to the end, and we recorded them all. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, questions from the panel, please. Good morning, and thank you very much for being here. I have one quick question. You mentioned the manner in which the witness statements were prepared, and that there were phone interviews that were recorded, and that after that, an integrated narrative was prepared. Who prepared that narrative? Was that prepared by the witness, or was that prepared by an investigator or the person who had spoken with them? The interviews that we had with the witnesses were in the form of questions and answers. We carried out these witness, these interviews, and one of our colleagues just wrote them down, and one of the members of the prosecutor team uh, turned these questions and answers into a story form. So as you have received them, they are based on a, a uh, date, uh, 25th of Auburn, 26th of Auburn, and the like. But the t prosecutor team was the one who uh, put them together and organized them. That's, that's what we did. And one last question is, once that statement was prepared, was it given to the witness to interview to check for veracity, or what, did you go with what you had had at that point? Uh, veracity, excuse me. but. Occasionally, mistakes are made, and yeah. I'm just wondering if the witness had the opportunity with that final statement. Mm -hmm. uh, In connection to this point, we thought a lot, and we thought how we should uh, uh, check the statements with the witness with the witnesses. But because of security issues, we decided not to send these statements back to the witnesses because this could have been a document against them. Many of them were still. Uh, exposed to security threats, and if it had been re uh, uh, revealed that they had uh, provided such uh, statements, they would have been exposed to further risk. But some of the information uh, were checked uh, verbally with the witnesses, especially during the days before the tribunal, we checked with them uh, so that they would approve the statements that they had provided. We read these statements to them, in fact, and asked them to verify and to uh, confirm verbally that this was true. But because of security issues, we did not send back the written statements because we thought that would cause put them into further risk and danger. Thank you, Ms. Uh, for money. You testified that some of the persons that you were in touch with decided in the end not to testify. Are you able to indicate in a very general way some of the types of pressures that persons faced which resulted in them not just not testifying before the tribunal? Vale, vale. Yes, I can. Some of these individuals were the families of those killed. From all these 275 people, apart from the first 25 first individuals, 250 had contacted us directly and wanted to testify. But some of them were the families of those killed, who still were under pressure and under uh, torture and uh, uh, disturbance. They are being called, they are being threatened not to talk to media, not to talk to anyone, not to object and they are being threatened that their other children would be put into danger or may be arrested. We even had some witnesses who said that they said they wanted to testify, but they had lost one brother. 
and he was being threatened that his other brother could easily be killed as well. And many of these witnesses said that they had been threatened that they will be run over by a car and their children, their brother, their sister would be killed. And it was quite logical that these individuals would be worried about the, lo the, the life of their loved ones. Some of the other witnesses were the ones who were eyewitnesses. They were the eyewitnesses of the protests. And those also received some threatening messages. What we realized during this process was that the security officials of Iran every now and then sent some threatening reports and mes threatening messages to those who they thought that had participated in the protests, and especially those who had previously been arrested. We had some witnesses who, when re they received these messages, uh, they felt great. They, they felt under greater uh, uh, risk and uh, danger. And some others also, after they had received their verdict from the court, or they were uh, called again to appear before the court, or because of other developments, they thought that the risk of this would be too much for them. And some of the witnesses also who uh, withdrew, they did not withdraw their testimony, of course, but they said that they were not ready to, uh, to provide further interviews, were the ones who, after all the sufferings that they tolerated, said that they had said whatever they had, and we could use their uh, documents. And psychologically, I believe they were not able to uh, repeat the same uh, events. And it, this is quite difficult and also understandable. Thank you. Were those uh, making the threats um, identified? And how, how were they? Who, who was making the threats, according to the witnesses? Uh, Many of those were security, local security officials. For example, a, if they were the families of the murdered, uh, for example, the IRGC uh, um, office or other uh, uh, offices, local offices called them. And also some of them received some telephone calls and messages. Iranians are familiar with this issue. Sometimes they receive messages, texts, or telephone calls that indicate that they are being monitored and whatever uh, contact they will have with the media would uh, have repercussions. And uh, in many cases, it is not clear where the message comes from. There is uh, a message coming from a place th where there is no number, but people know that this comes from the uh, security officials. And many of these witnesses have even taken pictures of these messages that they have received, and they have forwarded these, message, these threat messages to us. Uh, many of these witnesses, despite all these threats and all the developments, and even though they have told us about it, they still have insisted that they wanted to testify before this tribunal. I want to add one point, if you would allow me. As an individual who has been in touch with these witnesses in the past year and a half, uh, I should say that the uh, reason that some of the witnesses were not ready to provide further uh, testimonies be was because the, this process has become a bit prolonged. This process has taken a year and a half, and many of them um, have um, and we did not have the chance to interview them immediately after they contacted us for one hour. And some of them, since they had suffered, uh, tolerated a lot of sufferings during this time, maybe this long uh, uh, span of time has really made them tired. And uh, this could have been another reason that some of these witnesses just confined themselves to providing uh, written statements and also the documents that they had already sent us. And they were not willing to interview any further. Let's ask another question. Um, in terms of um, whether the witnesses know each other, were you able to verify um, any, anything concerning that? Whether the witnesses were independent from each other or whether they were members of the same family, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, we did not uh, let anyone know who had testified before us. All the witnesses who came to us have their own names uh, recorded. 
and we had certain cases where two friends had testified, two individuals who had participated in one uh, protest demonstrations at the same time, and when we when we were ref when we when we were reading their statements, they were referring to the names of each others, uh, but we never told either one of them that their friend had also testified, and we had some testimonies. Uh, one of uh, the families of the killed ones had testified about their loved one, and another person who was also familiar with that family had witnessed the death of that individual on the street and all the incident uh, and all the developments uh, that had happened was being witnessed by the individual. The mother was not aware of that. But we didn't, neither told the mother that someone had testified that he had witnessed the killing of his of her son, and we did not tell the individual who testified about the fact that the mother of the individual had also testified. So the people were not aware that uh, they were testifying. Just to um, push on that a little. Um, but could could the were you satisfied that the witnesses were not in touch with each other? So you were getting independent accounts as a general rule. If the witnesses were in touch with each other, well, we don't know because we never told them. Uh, we did, never gave them information with whom we interviewed. But uh, each of them had their own stories to tell and their stories were being compared with other resources. And we may say that, yes, there were some cases that two individuals were testifying about an event, and some of these uh, uh, testimonies were not in line with each other. But we did not refer back to them. And we, for example, we never told them that uh, Witness 133 has said this in this connection, and you as Witness 134 have said something else about the issue. We did not want to connect these individuals to each other. And because of security issues, we uh, observed this uh, limitation. And we never really thought that the witnesses had coordinated to testify uh, in a particular way. We never really came to such a conclusion or such an impression. Thank you. Yes, please. I just have one other question, a bit more mundane, I guess. Um, you mentioned there were 255 individuals who contacted, am I correct in that? Uh, yeah, uh, 200. Uh, yes, 275. No, and if you don't, that's fine. Um, how many different areas in the country did these people come from? How many different cities? Yeah, uh, it's, um, it, <laughs> I'm confused, it's in Farsi and English, sorry. Uh, Shahedan uh, our uh, um, witnesses came from 47 different cities, and we have the list of all these cities. And uh, I think that uh, Shiva Mehrani, uh, who, uh, when she uh, testifies here, she will also tell you what they are. We had 47 cities or villages that uh, testimonies came from. You mentioned that uh, you managed to find three police officers, one judicial official, and one airport employee, one officer of Khatam al Ambia Army Camp of Sepa Pasadaran, and two uh, physicians who treated the wounded at the hospital as uh, uh, witnesses. Yes. How did you find uh, that? Uh, witnesses. Uh, the, uh, no, no, it was these courageous witnesses uh, who contacted us, courageous witnesses who, despite all kinds of uh, serious dangers that threatens themselves and their families, they were the ones who contacted us and said that, that they wanted to offer their testimony. Just to follow up on that, how did you verify the identities of those individuals? Uh, in 
this was a very important uh, thing for us to do because, for example, as a police officer or somebody who was privy to the decisions of the establishment uh, for the suppression of the protests uh, had contacted us. And therefore, it was very important for us. And it was a difficult thing to do because we wanted to um, keep their security um, intact uh, because we wanted them to send us their identification or um, uh, further to that, to, to send us some documents to show that they actually had that position. That's to say that we wanted to know them both as a person that they existed, the, the individual identification based on uh, their official identification card, but also documents to show that they actually held the position that they said that they had. That's how we did it. And uh, as I said, it uh, uh, was something which was actually for me very frightening uh, because I was very concerned about maintaining their security. Uh, but I wanted to also ascertain that these were real witnesses who wanted to testify. Um, just one question. Uh, as a journalist, you must have been aware of newspaper publicity about where things happened in 2019, are you aware of any city or area in which there was violence and trouble from which no witnesses came forward? Uh, excuse me, could you repeat the last part, please? Which city was? Yes, I, I was interested in whether you know of any city where there was violence or serious trouble and from which there was no witness at all? Yes, uh, there were cities uh, where we know that, that the protests had been suppressed, had been suppressed in a serious way, but we did not have any witnesses coming forward from those cities. And there were even cities uh, which were important cities, and we did, did have witnesses who did testify about those cities, but we could not verify their testimony and uh, because of, for example, or the uh, personal problems or security problems could not include them in the 40 witnesses that we have in this tribunal. Um, but yes, uh, suppression of protests happened in a lot more than 47 cities from which we have witnesses. And many of our witnesses came from cities that not only the uh, protests were suppressed in them, like uh, Shiraz, Kurdistan, Esfahan, and Karaj, but these are cities where the access of people to the media and internet was more in the big cities. But in the smaller cities, that was, that was not the case. It could be that the witnesses themselves could not have access to those in order to contact us, and therefore, we could not have them. I would be very interested, if it's not too much trouble, for us to get uh, the names of those cities where there was trouble and about which you got no evidence because of suppression. I don't have the names right now here, but we do have them in our documents. We do have all the information, and we could present it to you during uh, this, uh, this meeting. Very helpful. Thank you. If there are no more questions from the panel, um, any questions arising uh, that Council would like to put to the witness? Just one follow-up question, Ms. Pumani from Council. Between 2020, when the, uh, the Bond Tribunal started collecting evidence up until today, how many times has the Internet been affected where people would have trouble communicating with you uh, or reaching the Tribunal to give evidence? Uh, Yes, this has been one of our serious problems. Aside from security problems, we have also had internet problems. Uh, many of the witnesses they have, did not have good access to the internet and during our contacts, especially when we wanted to have a, a, a one-hour voice contact, many a time in the internet would be interrupted because we didn't have access. Uh, for many weeks, probably, we couldn't have access to our witnesses. And again, uh, we would um, 
be connected through the internet. And in order to have these witnesses in the tribunal, one of the serious problems that we encountered was that they should be people who would have good access to the internet, because many of them use access to the internet, which is very weak, and many a time it is interrupted. Uh, many a time it was interrupted during our interviews. Perhaps uh, we, uh, we would have uh, an interview that was supposed to take only 30 minutes and it would take two hours because of the disruption in the internet. But in any event, because these people wanted to testify in no matter what way and because they wanted their voice to be heard um, and uh, they wanted other, they didn't want other people to forget them, they were very patient, they went through all the trouble and at the end ultimately we could record the testimony. If that's the end of the questions, um, mm -hmm. th thank you very yes. much, uh, Ms. Fumani, for helping the tribunal. Um, we uh, suspect we won't hear from you again, but uh, we might. Thank you.